<laughs> I'm supposed to be talking about Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And I only have, what, 40 minutes? Um, normally when I speak, uh, I guess I'm the shortest person here. Um, <laughs> normally when I speak, this is uh, 16 hours of instruction on Chinese medicine. So I'm not quite sure how I'm going to be able to do it justice. Uh, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, before we start, have any of you looked outside? Isn't this a gorgeous location that Dr. Chaudhry found? I mean, this is really amazing. The conference is about healing, and sometimes we get so wrapped up in our intellectual minds that we forget to look outside that we forget what it is to actually just sit and to be, and to be able to relax and to calm ourselves down in a way that is truly the source of healing. And sometimes we forget, because of life's busy schedules, what it really means to live. Now to us, in Chinese medicine, I'm gonna to try to summarize this very quickly utilizing past presenters. And Dr. Wagner was talking exclusively about the gut and the, what we call the enteric nervous system, which rivals the CNS. And in ancient China, they just called that the lower Dantian. They really didn't understand all the mechanics of it, but they knew that health starts in this lower Dantian, this physical manifestation down here. And, you know, some of your most basic things for survival go on down here. So if you think about the assimilation of food, the digestion of food, and the ability to transport that food, the ability to eliminate toxins and poisons, the ability to where your diaphragm inserts into an area of the lower back called Ming Men, which is right between your two kidneys, which all babies start out breathing into that area. And somehow, as we get to be an adult, we forget to breathe into our back. And that lower area, when we breathe into it, acts as internal massage for the internal organs. So this lower Dantian, this enteric nervous system, starts with two of the most important concepts in Chinese medicine, which we call postnatal qi. Postnatal qi is basically breath and then a simulation of all food, drink, medicines, as well as everything that you place on your skin. We know that we can absorb transdermally, but we never think about what we place on our skin, such as deodorant or makeup, until we have an allergic reaction, and we know then our body is rejecting that. But all of those things are absorbed internally. And that process is what we call the lower dantian, or from your belly button down to your perineum. The second dantian is called the middle dantian, and that is from the belly button up to about right where we were tapping with Dr. Nicosia. And this is where, and I'm going to use our own, my own words here, emotional content. This is where Dr. Candace Perp would talk about the neuropeptides of emotion that are coursing through your blood and that effect that it has on all your hormone levels and on your brain. This is also the area that heart math, I don't know, have are any of you familiar with heart math out in California? Their research that basically says that the heart emits various hormones that then synchronize with the lower Dantian and synchronize with the brain, which we call the upper Dantian. So you could see that 7,000 years ago, they were talking about three regions of the body that needed to be integrated as one. And in the Tao Te Ching, 
which is the classical textbook of Taoist and of most acupuncturist study. It talks about the three become the two, the two become the one. So in other words, when you're speaking of mind-body, you're really speaking of these three Dantians, regardless of the words in the classifications that we use in Western medicine. We're saying the same things, we're just using a different language. And in that, we have to realize that we have to take care of each of these compartments. We have to take care of our physical nature. In other words, we have to eat, and we have to eliminate, and we have to breathe. That's a pretty important trinity that I think a lot of people forget about in the basis of healing. I had a patient that came to me, it was a young 23-year-old woman who had severe endometriosis, had four surgeries already, was placed on a particular drug that had placed her into menopause at age 23. And what I found out that nobody asked her before is that, can you imagine this? She goes to the bathroom, number two, poop, once a month. How is that healthy? How does that escape questions? How did that fall through the cracks? So based on what I've told you so far about the enteric nervous system, or what Dr. Wagner talked about, bacteria imbalances, how do you think that that's affecting her entire system? She also had chronic pain. Is there any surprise? Not just chronic pain down here, systemic because she also had fibromyalgia. When you're speaking of these three dantians or these three systems, you have to get to the root of what's causing it. And sometimes it's something very simple. And we overlook the simple sometimes for the complex. And if I can get anything across to you today is to take a look at the very simplistic things that you're doing, like taking a moment to look outside and to appreciate, A, that you are breathing, B, that you can take the time to enjoy this conference, and C, you can still learn and articulate. These are wonderful things that we have, but sometimes we forget that we have them. And so a part of what I do is not just integrating these three Dantians, Working with their emotional content, working with, in fact, their enteric nervous system, and working on how this enteric nervous system works and synchronizes with the brain. So all your basic symptoms, they're now linking depression with the gut, based on bacterial studies that they're doing, and the, they are now uncovering the relatively 1,000 bacterium differentiated within the gut and they are going to be able to take each of those bacterium, figure out which ones are overbalanced, underbalanced, and devise something, because the pharmaceutical industry has a huge interest in this, of course, to give you as a pill that in fact is going to be bacterium personified that's going to balance that enteric nervous system and they're believing that this is going to usher in a new age of pharmaceuticals. Have any of you heard this? No? <laughs> okay, well, glad to share it with you. Um, look up, just look this up, just Google it. There's oodles of information about it, and it's going to be the next wave of healing. My teacher, who was the 88th generation physician and priest, I'm the 89th generation physician and priest. Talked about this, and it was written about 7,000 years ago. Think about that for a second. This information has been around a long time. Do you know how we used to do it in the old days? How did we balance bacterium? We used food. Different foods contain different bacteriums. And I can give you a great example of that, fermented foods. In our modern day, since we're able to preserve, refrigerate, and transport 
We don't use fermented foods like we used to even 50, 60 years ago, prior to World War II. And we have changed our chemistry, people. We have changed our lower dantian. We have changed it in a way that is causing numerous amounts of diseases. And this lower dantian was always the first and the primary focus of bringing things back into balance and order in the Chinese medical system. Once you could assimilate, once you could eliminate, and once you could breathe, then we're gonna talk about your emotional content, not before. Because until you can process things, and before you can rebuild cells, we don't want to create a cascade of neuropeptides into your bloodstream that's gonna cause you imbalance. In Chinese medicine, you've probably heard of yin and yang, is all about balance. Balance of very simple things. Sleep, food, digestion, assimilation, breathing, management of stress, the ability to have tools to be able to manage that. That is the essence of Chinese medicine. It's no different today than it was 7,000 years ago. And my teacher always told me that what I would want for you is to be able to stand on my shoulders and take Chinese medicine into the 21st century. To be able to show its validity, to be able to get it to a place where it's integrated into other medicines. Because if you could take 7,000 years of accumulated wisdom and integrate that into our current knowing. There's a lot of information there that we could use. Just like they had complete systems worked out to balance the enteric nervous system that we're just now in the 21st century researching. Isn't that curious? Things come full circle. Not surprising, but curious. So this three system way of looking at things was about simplification. And sometimes when you're dealing with complex, multi-symptomatic patients, you have to get really simple in order to make any kind of improvement or even to get them to change. Because obviously the state that they're currently in is not serving them well. And we have to elicit change. And that change often is not comfortable. So that's where you bring the emotional content in. I don't want to eat right. You know, I like to stay up late and watch TV till 2 o'clock in the morning and fall asleep in my chair rather than going to bed at 10 because I know I should because I'm not getting enough sleep. My cycles, my circadian rhythms are completely imbalanced, and I know that, but I'll just take Ambien. It takes a certain amount of self-responsibility and it has a very huge implication in our modern world. And so, Chinese medicine is very much at its heyday right now because we're at a peak of autoimmune disease. There is more autoimmune disease today than there ever has been in history. And sometimes you call auto, autoimmune disease inflammation. Where do you think the majority of inflammation starts? Take a wild guess. The lower dantian, the gut. And where does that cascade to? If you affect the gut, you affect the brain. All SSRIs basically work on the gut. Passing through the blood brain barrier uses two chemicals called zonulin and zot, which was discovered at the University of Maryland. So in order to have anything past the blood-brain barrier, you have to have your gut in order. So the gut has to be stabilized first. Think of the foundation of a house. The house is no more stable than its foundation, and that's what the enteric nervous system is, or the lower dantian is. If you haven't looked into these things, please do, for your own health and well-being, as well as for your patients. Because I'm here to remind you that things that we were learning 7,000 years ago 
are still applicable today. So a lot of people think that Chinese medicine is just about acupuncture. Has anybody here had acupuncture? A few of you, okay. It works wonderfully for pain modulation. It works wonderfully. One of my students is now one of the premier physicians that is working in Oakland, California, utilizing acupuncture for chemotherapy patients. And what we found is it reduces nausea. Those of you who know anything about chemotherapy, a lot of it causes enormous amounts of nausea, and then they can't eat. Meanwhile, they're going through chemotherapy. Chemotherapy notoriously makes people lose weight because of lack of appetite because it kills the intestinal flora in the lower dantian. Is it starting to make sense? So what we can do is re-regulate that lower dantian, calm down the nausea, the patient can eat, the patient therefore has the raw materials to rebuild cells, which is the whole premise of chemotherapy in the first place. They're using that, and they've also noticed that they have reduced pain medications and nausea medications, nausea medications almost by 100%, pain medications by 50. Why not use the wisdom of the past to help future generations? Here's the other interesting thing. One of my other students is actually working as the head acupuncturist for the Ironman competition in Kona, Hawaii. These are the elite athletes of the elite. And he's using specifically medical qigong, which we can talk about, to calm patients down before the race, as well as to alleviate pain after the race. And so the recuperation period is a lot higher. Interesting, very interesting. So this is how Chinese medicine is, is basically integrating into today's medical system. Uh, I have another student in Maryland. He's a psychiatrist who's using exclusively medical Qigong to work with depressives and bipolars and schizophrenics. And he's reporting enormous success. I have another patient, or patient, <laughs> I have another student who is a MD, he's an anesthesiologist at one of the largest hospitals in Pennsylvania, Geisinger, and he is using medical Qigong prior to anesthesia to calm people down without any drugs. Because if that person goes into the surgery anxious, how is their healing affected? Think about the fight or flight syndrome and what happens to the blood circulation. Where is it going? It's going to the periphery, right? So he is using these methods in hospitals as is the physician in California to regulate people, to calm people down because we know stress is at the root of a lot of this evil which causes the inflammation process in the first place. So if we can address these things with completely natural methods, why not use them? Why aren't we using them? Why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we integrating this deeper? So, you know, to me, this is, have you ever heard of the term functional medicine? Okay, this is, this is big now, right? A lot of MDs are going over to functional medicine. One of my other students, who's an MD, who's a functional medicine practitioner, uses acupuncture and medical qigong exclusively in her practice. So we're, we're starting to see it in all walks of life, from anesthesiology to psychiatry to functional medicine to elite athletes. They're using this. They're already using this. They're using the mind-body connection. They're using Chinese medicine. And, you know, when I go and teach, I teach around the world, but, you know, it, it, when I come back to this area, we're kind of slow in jump-starting a lot of these programs. When you go to California and Palm Springs, you know, in Palm Springs, California, uh, you know, there's a lot of right retirees out there, right? So they have a higher elderly population. So. Nip, uh, hip and knee 
replacements are pretty common. They're big business out there. Do you know immediately upon completion of surgery, even when you're in recovery, they start to do acupuncture because they have reduced pain threshold by 50 to 60%. And these people are up moving and conscious a lot faster. Why aren't we doing that here in Pittsburgh? Questions, good questions. So you can see that it's permeating a lot of different thought processes. Now Chinese medicine is just more than just acupuncture. As I mentioned, it's also using food as medicine, which is another catchy topic, to regulate not only bacteria, but to regulate pH, to basically regulate autoimmune function. And all of this is documented in time. It, it's not something we have to relearn. There's the power in these postnatal qi therapies that we can use today. So, you know, it's as simple as teaching people some of these things to empower themselves, like what foods to eat and how to breathe and how to calm down from stress. These things are basic, that you can be empowered. You can have an internal locus of control. Going back home and say, you know what? I am involved in the process of my healing. I am not waiting to go to someone to do it for me. I am in this too. And I think that's an enormously important piece of information for everyone who's faking, facing cancer, MS, mental difficulties, across the board. To know that they're in the process, know they're in the game to rely on themselves, to have that ability to be empowered once again. Because I'm telling you, the disease process has a tendency to disempower all of us and to make us feel like this is out of control. So the more that we can do these types of things to gift to our patients and our clients, the better. Now, here's the thing. You can't bill for teaching someone to breathe, and you can't bill, unless you're a nutritionist, for teaching someone how to eat. And I'm not sure you really want to. So, a lot of these things get left out. A lot of these things people don't believe are important. But in Chinese medicine, they were always the foundation so, you know, I, I, I did this at, how many were here last year? Yes? Okay, a few of you, okay. So, I want to have you just do an experiment with the person next to you. I want you to see for yourself if you're breathing with your original manufacturer's settings. Do you think, just consider this, that a baby has a lot of stress. What do you think? Do you think a baby has a lot of stress? Only when it's hungry, only when it's sleepy. But it really doesn't have to worry about taxes. It doesn't have to worry about mortgages. It doesn't have to worry about the family. It doesn't have to worry about education. It, that's beyond it right now. It's just taking in the beauty of what's around it, using all of its senses to center itself. And so we use that as a model in Chinese medicine. We call it the age of innocence, prior to our acquired mental programming. And when you breathe like a baby, you breathe like we do in Qigong. And that is breathing with your back, as well as your stomach, as well as your sides. And all of those directions expand three-dimensionally and contract. So I want you to stand up, if you all would, humor me. And I want you to have a partner. And I would like you to first greet your partner, if you haven't greeted your partner, say hello, howdy, shake hands. Because now you're going to touch each other. Oh my god. 
And what I would like you to do is one is going to be the biofeedback and one is going to be the breathing candidate. The breathing candidate is just going to breathe normal and then take a really deep breath and the biofeedback person is just going to put their hand on the lumbar part of the lower back. And what I want you to do is I want you to see when that person takes that deep inhale, does the lower back move or not? Just try that. Just see if it moves. Nothing? Nada? How many of you got something? Is there life back there? <laughs> Switch partners. Switch partners. Couple minutes. Is it moving back there? Is it moving? Some of you, yes. Some of you, no. Okay. Very good. Now. That's how you're supposed to breathe. That is the original manufacturer settings. If that is not moving, your enteric nervous system is bound up. If that is not moving, you are not massaging your internal organs and you're not stimulating the enteric nervous system. So breathing has huge implications. And you could all sit down now if you would. Breathing has huge implications because when people get stressed, the first thing they do is they breathe up rather than breathe back. And it's a very simple thing to start to orient your patients towards is to breathe into the back. Original manufacturer's equipment. If they do that, think about anxiety and how the energy rushes upwards. It rushes up through the meridians, rushes up internally through the blood, high blood pressure, all those things, and you are giving it instructions in commanding it by your intention and consciousness to be able to go into the lower dantian and ground that person. Do you understand what I mean by the word grounding? Right? Grounding that person through the breath, which doesn't involve medication, which doesn't involve anything other than being able to breathe correctly yet again. And in Qigong practice, we teach you to be able to do that to such an extent that your back can expand almost two inches. That's hard to believe. But you can have that much elasticity back there. The Chinese call that point Mingmen, which translates to gate of life which holds your destiny, which holds your ability to connect to the divine. So the Chinese hold that very sacred, to be able to massage that point daily, to be able to have the connection to the divinity, whatever that is for you, and to be able to exercise that on a daily, continuous basis. That it's not something separate. That it's not something or some place that you go. It is with you constantly, and you carry that with you. And you must activate it and engage it. And in that, in most indigenous cultures, they have some kind of breathing techniques, meditations, yoga, all kinds of different practices to get you to have this awareness. The Chinese have just given it a name. And they say until you breathe into that area for 10 years, what they consider one cycle, you will not fulfill your destiny. Think about that for a second. 10 years old. At the age 10, you might have still been breathing into that area. 
Think about the age 20 when you're in college, some of you. And the stress of life starts to get to you. And you're working a job, and you're going to school, and you're carrying what? What are they doing now? 18 credits, right? And you're working a job. Do you really think you're breathing into your Ming men? Probably not. And then you get married, and then you have kids. Do you really think you're breathing into your Ming men? You got a job, and that job's phased out, and you're going back to school, and all these things like that. Do you really think you're breathing into your Ming men? Probably not. <laughs> if I was a betting man, I would say, mm mm, no. This is something so simple. That activates, you know how we were tapping? Your breathing activates the acupuncture meridian system in the same way, only internally, not externally from a needle being placed in, but internally the way nature intended it to be by activating the enteric nervous system and the central nervous system simultaneously. When you do this, you are harmonizing the body from the inside out unlike most of us who try to harmonize the body from the outside in, what we eat, what we do, those kind of different things. But we all know we go to bed with our own mind at night. And if the internal aspect is not harmonized with the external, then you need to start with the internal prior to the external. Do you follow? If I can teach you anything today, is to pay attention to your internal. When you look outside and you see beauty, can you close your eyes and see the same beauty inside of you? Can you be content with who you are? Can you walk in center with the divine? Can you be that person manifesting your destiny with every breath? When you can do that, you will be at peace, regardless of the situation that you're in. Even if you have cancer, even if you have MS, even if you have pathology, to be at peace is the ultimate goal. To return back to the state which you came in, to go full circle, to return to the one, as we say in Taoism. And that, my friends, is what everyone's seeking. They don't realize that the secret is within them and harmonizing themselves in these three Dantians that I spoke of. And that is why we use that still today as a metaphor to speak to everything that we are searching for as, as complicated as it is to be a human being. You can keep flowcharting and strategizing and dividing and talking about division and, and various types of subsets of systems and so forth, but it's only when you harmonize, when you balance yin and yang, when you put together your own center and can operate in that center in peace and not wish you were someone else, not wish that you were like something else, or not wish that you had something external from what you already have, then and only then will your three Dantians be balanced. And then and only then will you find peace and harmony. That, my friends, is the de definition of health to me. You all may have different views, and that's perfectly fine. One of the things we learn in formless Taoism is that we don't judge. So your opinion is your opinion. I'm just expressing mine and how I choose to live. It's completely within your control. And it starts with something as simple as the breath, which denotes life, does it not? And the exhalation of breath denotes that transition. So you're returning to your source every time you practice these simple, simple practices of what you take in and what you choose to release every single day and how you choose to walk. That to me is the essence of Chinese medicine. The herbs and the acupuncture, these are just catalysts so that I can give you a kickstart. Your own body does the healing. It's miraculous. I don't think there's anybody in here that understands the human body completely. We can study all kinds of things for in our entire lives because we still don't understand how some things work. All I know is this is a miracle. It's a miracle I woke up this morning 
<laughs> when you read the Merck manual and you see all the things that can go wrong with you, it's a miracle you woke up. And that is a miracle that you should celebrate, plain and simple. So I take great confidence in this miracle that takes place of healing, of rebalancing, because that's what healing is. It's just this rebalancing. And when you can practice that in such a simple practice as sitting in your car and just breathing, standing in line at the bank and just breathing and knowing that you're in center and learning how to release and let go and to be at peace with that, you're going to heal. You are going to heal. How much time do I have? I have no idea. Five minutes? Okay, I timed that pretty well. <laughs> so, so, I'm going to open this up for questions. Anything you've ever wanted to know about Chinese medicine? Herbs, acupuncture, jegu, all kinds of different ways. We have chiropractic. We have all kinds of methodologies in our system that have been forgotten about. Anything that you can imagine, we have in Chinese medicine. Any practice out there? we have in Chinese medicine, because we've studied the human condition for 7,000 years. So what questions would you have? <laughs> There's a question. Yes? I think one of the most dangerous Yes. Uh, I'm hoping because uh, one of my students that I mentioned, the anesthesiologist. Oh, okay. Basically, he was uh, stating the fact that anesthesia is one of the most dangerous practices in the United States due to the fact of a number of lawsuits, et cetera, and things that can go wrong. And he also mentioned very wisely that they do surgical procedures in China without any anesthesia. In fact, President Nixon witnessed the first appendectomy done solely with acupuncture needles while the person was conscious, awake, and talking. Hard to believe, but they do this on a frequent basis and they do teach how to do this. One of my students is now going to, for the first time, practice anesthesia using only medical qigong and not even needles. And he's doing that right here in Pennsylvania. So stay tuned, this may be changing the way we think about what we need to do with anesthesia. It's all about the integration. Yes? Right. Um, I practice in the metropolis of Leechburg, which is population about 2,000. <laughs> and I live on a farm, so my clinic is on a farm, and that's where I also have my Chinese medicine clinic and where we educate people from around the world. Um, secondly, um, as I was taught, we use food first, supplementation second. So we believe in the power of food, the diversity of food, that we currently have available to us, but we do believe in the power of food first and supplementation second. That does not mean I don't use supplements, but I base it on the ability to assimilate and digest those supplements, and that is on a case-by-case -case basis. Other questions? Yes. 
Do I have what? Weight loss. Weight loss. Weight loss. Uh, yeah, we do. We do. Right. One of the interesting things that you'll find when you first start to practice Qigong is that when people start to actually circulate their Qi and they stand like in a Wu Qi posture and they're just standing, right? Their knees are slightly flexed and, and those kind of different things that they will profusely begin to sweat. So how could you be standing and be sweating buckets? Through the circulation of qi, through the burning of kilocalories, of course, right? It's just thermoregulation. That's what's taking place. But there's something interesting that happens in this energy world of qi, that we basically can stand there and metabolize at a higher level by using our own mind. And people can't believe it until they experience it because they think that they have to move. They have to run, they have to lift weights, they have to do these kinds of things. So think of it, think of the implications of people in wheelchairs. Think of people that are non-mobile. How they could thermoregulate and lose weight with some of these ancient methods of regulation. It's an interesting thought. We're about out of time. Yes, thank you very much. Shay Shay.